would like to introduce you today to James W. Lowen. Jim is an American sociologist, historian, and author who's best known for his 1995 book, Lies My Teacher Told Me, Everything Your American History Textbook Got Wrong. So welcome, Jim Lowen. Hey, I'm glad to be with you. Jim, it seems like your mission is to overturn myths and misinformation that too often pass for U.S. history. You spent two years at the Smithsonian Institute where you studied and compared 12 American history textbooks that were then widely used across the United States. When did you start to realize that there might be truth versus fiction in our classrooms? I actually had an aha experience that caused me ultimately to write this book. It first caused me to write a different book. So I have to tell you about this experience. It happened at Tougaloo College in Mississippi. That was my first full-time teaching job. And so there I was at this 99% black college. Um, the faculty is more interracial, but and I was teaching the courses I expected to be teaching in sociology, but I was also asked to teach and did teach one course called the Freshman Social Science Seminar. So this was a course invented by the history department. It was enshrouded in black history. That is, the main textbook was a textbook about African-American history. Made sense, all of our, almost all of our students being black. Um, and it introduced students to sociology, psych, economics, poli sci, the, the social sciences. Well, when you're in that context, that's the same chronology as, shall we say, regular American history. And so the second semester begins not only after Christmas, but it also begins right after the Civil War with, of course, the period known as Reconstruction. So that first afternoon class in January, I had a new group of students, 17 students, and I didn't want to do all the talking. So I said to them, okay, we're supposed to start here with Reconstruction. What, what does that period connote to you? What do you know about that? And 16 out of 17 of my students said, Reconstruction was the period right after the Civil War, when Blacks took over the government of the Southern states, but they were too soon out of slavery, and so they screwed up, and white folks had to take control again. And I'm glad you made that case because, in fact, there's at least three direct lies in that sentence. I mean, black folks never took over the government of the Southern States. All of the Southern States had uh, white governors throughout the period. All but one had white legislative majorities. Um, they did get to vote. They did get some people elected. Uh, it might look like a black takeover if you're used to a totally, totally, totally white system, but it, 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 was, it was never a takeover. Second of all, the Reconstruction governments did not screw up. In Mississippi particularly, we have better government during Reconstruction than at any later point in the entire 19th century. Uh, and so it wasn't white folks who took control at the end of Reconstruction. It was a certain batch of white folks. It was the KKK, the utterly white supremacist Democrats. And we've got to remember the Democrats were the party of overt white supremacy in that century. And they took over. Um, and I thought to myself, my God, what must it do to you to believe that the one time your group was center stage in U.S. history, they screwed up? And, and then there's the concept, too soon out of slavery, you know, as if that, that could be a concept. Uh, slavery was not an educational institution. It was, of course, a felony to teach black folks to read or write during slavery, even free blacks. So how could this happen? Well, I went to nearby high schools. And this was just before massive school desegregation in the Deep South. So I went to nearby black high schools and I watched as black teachers taught all black classes, white supremacist history, because they were just teaching what was in the textbook. So after trying to get other people to do it, I finally got a grant and I put together a, a batch of students and faculty at Tougaloo and also at Millsaps, the nearby white school, and we wrote a new history of Mississippi. Now, Mississippi, like half of all states, adopts books statewide. Everybody hears about 
Texas, and Texas is the most notorious, but all of the southern states, and as I say, half of all states, adopt statewide. So our book had to get adopted. So our book didn't get adopted. There were only two books. Uh, Mississippi usually adopts three to five books in any given subject. But by a two to five vote, the state textbook board rejected our book and adopted just one book. Well, there just by chance happened to be two blacks and five whites on that textbook board. Uh, you might be able to guess how the vote went. Uh, so eventually, we wound up suing the board and suing the state. And the fact that the uh, lawsuit is fairly famous, it's called Lowen et al. versus Turnipseed et al. And um, I got to tell you a story about that. I, I got to choose the lead defendant. And I just had to choose Turnipseed because of his name. Uh, his name is John Turnipseed. He's dead now. but uh, And um, I didn't realize at the time that I was screwing myself out of my 15 seconds of fame or whatever we're supposed to get. Because, you know, Brown v. Board of Education is, of course, for short, it's known as, you tell me. Well, I'm not sure I would say, you'd say it. It's known as Brown. It's not known as Board. All right. Plessy v. Ferguson is known as Plessy. What do you think Lowen v. Turnipseed is known as? The turnip seed, my yeah, age? Of course it is. So anyway, um, but we got a wonderful decision. We had an 83-year-old white Mississippian who believed in the First Amendment, students' rights to controversial information. Now, there's nothing controversial about what we had in our book. It was only controversial in this, the context of the educational system of Mississippi. So then I left Mississippi after that happened uh, later and uh, wound up at the University of Vermont. So I claim I've taught at the blackest and the whitest universities in America. Uh, well, I found the same idiotic stupidities going on in my first year students at Vermont as in Mississippi. I just realized that Mississippi was a more exaggerated form of this problem, as Mississippi is a more exaggerated form of a lot of problems in America, um, but it's the American problems. And so that led me finally to address that problem by writing lies my teacher told me. Now that's a long answer to your question, but that's how come it happened. I sense there is a passion in your work. And I started to wonder whether that passion might be founded in anger. Well, I am angry on behalf of my students, not just my black students, but also my white students. I mean, certainly, let's think about a white Mississippian, 18 years old, just graduated from high school um, back in the 1970s, when, 60s during the civil rights movement. And that's when I started. Um, he or she has been lied to just as much as the black students. Matter of fact, it's the same lie taught by the same textbook. Um, and by the way, the author of the textbook absolutely knew that he was lying. He was a perfectly good historian who knew the truth, but he also knew what the Mississippi textbook board wanted him to say, and he said it. You know, it's as simple as that. But anyway, if I were an 18-year-old white Mississippi high school graduate, I wouldn't be in favor of letting black folks vote because I would know that the last time they voted is terrible and they screwed up, you know? Uh, so uh, it, it does make me angry. Uh, and I think in, in a more general sense, the way we teach history in the United States to this day is without causality. We don't understand how one thing causes another. And one reason why we don't understand that is because the textbooks want to avoid all controversy. So therefore, they never relate history to the present. Well, if history has no relationship to the present, then what the heck are we studying it for? It's totally irrelevant. And that's what most high school students think their history course is, irrelevant. And the why question is so important. Yeah. If we want to know, for instance, how to increase racism, we can look at history and see that it increased around 1890. And between 1890 and 1940, it's called the nadir, the low point of race relations, the high point I guess, of uh, racism in America as an ideology. And that's when sundown towns formed. And I wrote the book called Sundown Towns, all white towns, but all across the North. And they formed in the early 20th century. Well, um, 
we know how to make a really racist society and we know how to make a really unracist society because we've done that at other times. So that's what I'm finding so hopeful about the last oh, six weeks, let's say, uh, that we're trying to become less racist, we're trying to become more accurate in our monuments, and we're trying to become uh, more complex in our sundown town. I want to talk a lot about that, but uh, let me go back a little further. Every decision it seems like we make takes us one direction or another. Can you think of a decision that you've made in your past that kind of influenced where you are in your life today? Oh, yes. Um, it was during my junior year in college. Uh, and the, I, had, I grew up in Decatur, Illinois, which is an interracial town, but it's not very diverse otherwise. And it's kind of a boring town right in the middle of Illinois. Then I went off to Carleton College in southern Minnesota. And at the time, Carleton was overwhelmingly white. Uh, we had exactly one black student in our class, and he was the sixth black student in the 100-year history of Carleton College. Um, the faculty was totally white. Uh, I was intrigued by race relations. I didn't even know what sociology was when I went to college, actually. I was going to be a chemistry major. Uh, but then I became a, I, I had an interesting experience in intro soci, so I decided to major in sociology. And around my junior year, I realized that my friends who were in French, let's say, they were taking their junior year in France, which makes some sense. Uh, my friends who were in poli sci, they were taking a semester anyway in DC at American University. It's called the Washington semester. And here I was in sociology, and I had never lived outside the Midwest. I didn't think that was competent. And so I, I, I call it laughingly uh, my junior year abroad in Mississippi. Uh, and it was only a three month term, it wasn't the whole year. Um, but Mississippi was doing what it could to be a foreign country in 1963. It was right after James Meredith had integrated Ole Miss. And I went to Mississippi State and I chose Mississippi State on purpose because it was totally white, totally segregated. And I wanted to experience segregation. Uh, it wasn't exactly totally white. It did have Chinese Americans and it did have people from India who were rather dark, but you know, we do in our bizarre classification system, they get counted Caucasoids as if they came from the Caucasian mountains, which of course none of us came from, but anyway, never, never mind the bad science and all that. Uh, so so my, that, that transformed my life. Um, among other things, when I went on to Harvard and became a sociologist, it gave me my uh, topic for my dissertation. Uh, which is called the Mississippi Chinese between black and white, because I learned, of course, about this group uh, from meeting them. And then I did a whole research book on them. Uh, they came into the system more or less at the black level, kept out of white institutions. Some places had separate, shall we say, yellow schools, Chinese schools, little bitty ones. Some places they didn't go to school. Uh, they didn't want to be identified with African Americans for good reason, because African Americans had nothing. Uh, this was during the Nader. Um, and, and then around World War II, when China was our ally, they became admitted to white schools and white hospitals and things. And so they're, they're a fascinating case study. That's why they made a wonderful dissertation topic. And um, uh, so, so Mississippi for me has been the gift that just keeps on giving. It's a very interesting state and I've always enjoyed living. There. It's interesting that our paths and trajectories are somewhat the same. Uh, I grew up in Washington, Illinois and Peoria, Illinois. Uh, Washington was a sundown town, was it not? I, uh, yes, it was. Yeah. And I, well, I went to Peoria when I was a freshman in a uh, sophomore in high school. Okay. Uh, but I then, uh, after a few years of college, went to Minnesota and lived in Minnesota for 20 years. So, you know, a lot of what you have experienced in your past, 
I too have experienced in that mm -hmm. trajectory. And I can so relate to what you're saying. Back then, you know, when I was growing up, I, I didn't know any different. And I think that's a Neither. lot of what I'm hearing you say when you're talking about the textbooks because we learn from the textbooks or we learn from our surroundings. And it isn't necessarily what we find out is the truth at all later on. That's right. Um, where did you live in Minnesota? I lived in the Twin Cities. Yeah, so okay. uh, I handled the, I, I worked for three different housing authorities. So I had all the uh, cities on the, in Dakota County, which is the south side of Minneapolis, St. Paul. There are lots of sundown towns across Minnesota, but most of them, uh, and, and I need to explain that sundown town is a town that for many years was all white on purpose. Uh, when I say all white, I need to put quotation marks around it because, for example, Austin, Minnesota, which is a major railroad town and an even more major meatpacking town. Um, I think spam was invented in Austin, the kind you eat, uh, not the kind you get on your computer. Um, well, Austin was a sundown town, but it had one black man and maybe he had a family, I'm not sure. Uh, so all the time that it was pridefully all white, it had this black family. Uh, and that, and that's true for a lot of sundown towns. And that way the white folks can try to kind of say to themselves, um, well, we're not racist. Look at George or, or whoever he is. Um, uh, see, and then they imply that he's the only good one. Um, and, and it's their, their fault and black folks fault that they're not here. Uh, it's not our fault. Uh, so for example, near me in Illinois, Pena drove out its uh, black population in 1902, I think it was, but they didn't drive out the barber. Everybody liked the barber. The barber worked at the hotel. The barber let the shoeshine boy, who was likely to be 50 years old, you know, but, uh, but the barber was black, but his, he, he, he barbered white hair, uh, or white people's hair. Uh, so they didn't want to drive him out. And so Pena went so far as to put signs out. Austin didn't bother doing that, but saying, the N-word, nigger, don't let the sun go down on you in Pena uh, at four gates to the city. And meanwhile, they've got this one black family. So the, the 1910 census shows five black folks in Pena, but it's a sundown town for sure. May still be. It is, just seems so wrong. But, you know, you, as I said, you didn't know any better back then. You didn't even know what it was. Well, kids didn't. I mean, you know, the adults. No, I mean, kids. Because, I mean, kids. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I, they get, they got caught in school, and uh, uh, they become part of the problem too, especially when they become 15 to 20 years old. Uh, but what I'm seeing right now, and this is why it's been so amazing the last month, uh, since the the Floyd murder, um, many sundown towns have had BLM rallies, and in a few cases. The, the demonstrators are outnumbered by hecklers, but in some cases, like in Anna, Illinois, which is one of the most uh, overt and disgusting sundown towns, um, over 200 people came and the, the organizers were expecting 20. So there's change happening, I hope. This is gonna show how naive I am, but I, I can hardly believe there is such a thing today as a sundown town. So I'm way out of step, I guess. Yeah, have you ever, the richest suburb in America is sometimes considered to be Kenilworth, Illinois, which is a beautiful community just north of Chicago, just north of Evanston, uh, on the lake. Beautifully designed houses and, and so on. Kenilworth, so far as I know, has had two black families in the history of Kenilworth. It was founded as a sundown town, no black families, no Jewish families, with the exception of live-in servants. Live-in servants would be okay because of course they're not living independently. Um, and so it did have those. Well, it ha Kenilworth has had at least two black families. One lasted three months, one lasted 12 years. Um, so far as I know, the last I knew, there was not one single black family in Kenilworth. 
uh, and that was about seven years ago. I, I don't know if one's come in since then, maybe, maybe not. Um, and the, the, the word on the street there is, well, they, and you notice the use of the word they, uh, they don't have the money or they don't have the, the social power yet. They'll make it. Well, I got so tired of that that I actually looked it up and I found that in the Chicago metropolitan area, there are 7,000 black families that make more money than the median family in Kenilworth. So 7,000 black families could move into this little town, only has 2,500 families, um, and not one has chosen to do so. So something is going on and it is not something relating to the they. It's something relating to the we, the white folks in Kenilworth. That I'm not surprised about. Now, you sign your emails with telling the truth about the past helps cause justice in the present. Achieving justice in the present helps us tell the truth about the past. Tell me about that. I think that's brilliant. I'm so happy I came up with that. <laughs> the first part of it, telling the truth about the past. If we talk openly about the fact just to stick with Kenilworth for a minute, that Kenilworth in, 19, I think it was 1906, but it might've been 1896. I, I'm not a historian. I, the, the date sometimes, um, ever since uh, Coach DeMolin in uh, high school, the dates haven't stuck so well. But around, around 1900, plus or minus a few years, Kenilworth was founded with, um, among other things, the, the great precept that it have no black families and no Jewish families. All right, that seems a little disgusting right now, you know? Maybe even especially, I, I, I'm going to be blunt, maybe even especially about the Jewish part. You know, that kind of uh, fell into disfavor, let's say, during World War II, when we realized what that ideology can lead to. Um, so if we speak about it openly, I mean, right now, when you keep it quiet, then if I'm, if I'm in Chicago and I say, you know, when asked at a party, uh, I live in Kenilworth, People will say, oh, it's so nice there, isn't it? You, you know, they'll approve of me. They'll think well of me. An appropriate response would be, you do. Don't you realize? And then, you know, you don't have kids, do you? You're raising children in kennel words. You don't want to do that. I mean, that's what should be happening. So telling the truth about their past helps cause justice in the present, I think. And then the other way around. The other way around, I learned upside the head from textbooks, and that is this. Beginning around the end of 1970s, about 1979, 80, 81, the textbooks got really good in their treatment of our incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Now, why did that happen? After all, everybody knew what was going on at the time. It was well covered in the newspapers. A textbook in 1945 could have said it perfectly well, a textbook in 1950. But back then they didn't even mention it, or if they did, they kind of mentioned it in a very short paragraph or a paragraph that even kind of justified it. Well, could it have anything to do with the fact that at the end of the Reagan administration, at the beginning of the George H.W. Bush administration, the United States apologized. Um, and we made, we actually paid uh, uh, $20,000 to each victim of our incarceration. We made it right, or we made it as right as we could. I mean, the, the, the removal of three to four years of your life and you lost your business often in your home and so on. But still, we did what we could to make it right. Well, so now we can tell about it because now it's an American success story. So truth in the, uh, truth in the past is easier to come by when you've uh, achieved justice in the present. So it's an interlocking relationship. And my hope is that by facing the truth finally about the Confederacy and with the Confederate monuments, that that will help us have racial justice today. And we do seem to see that connection right now. So I think you must be involved in Black Lives Matter. Uh, talk to me about it. Well, I'm, I, I have participated in one Black Lives Matter march for about one block. It was going past me in, in uh, New York City, and I was pleased to, jo to join in. Um, right now in D.C., first of all, I'm 78 years old, and second of all, I've got uh, uh, serious cancer problems, so I'm not marching in anything, but I'm definitely involved in 
in the matter, yes. And, and the, the way I'm involved is for years, for many years actually, since before uh, the millennium changed, I've been arguing that Confederate monuments all lie, that they were put up as part of a white supremacy thing going on between 1890 and 1940, most of them, and that they need to be retired to museums and viewed as uh, examples of white supremacy. That's what's happening, you know? And, and uh, I did specifically make that argument, for instance, in Montgomery County, Maryland, and that triggered the movement that led to the removal of the Confederate monument from Rockville, Maryland. I participated in the argument um, at um, Yale, had an um, important building, it's actually had nothing but a dormitory, but they called them colleges, uh, named for John C. Calhoun. Well, John C. Calhoun was the architect of the theory that slavery is good for black people because black people are so inferior. Right? And he was also the architect of the theory that it's appropriate to secede if the federal government does something you don't like. Uh, so he is the brains behind the Civil War and the brains behind the white supremacy movement that led to the Civil War. Uh, and Yale has a building name for him. Well, he did attend Yale and he was a senator and he was very important. Who, who cares what he stood for? I mean, that, that's the thinking. Well, uh, I don't think that's good. I think if I were a black student assigned to that dormitory, I would be beside myself. I don't know what I'd do. And in fact, some of the people, black and white students, started protesting by camping out, you know, in the, in the Yale Green out in front of the building. I thought that was brilliant. Well, they changed the name. And what's happened recently, just last week, is John C. Calhoun got removed from the very high pedestal that he was on in Charleston, South Carolina. Now, I did not see that coming. That's wonderful. What characteristics do you think we need in leaders? I think that the important thing we need is a populace that understands causation in history. Because until we have a more educated populace, we are not necessarily going to have very good leaders. Uh, I think that two, the two go together. And that's why I think this, it's very important to shape up history as it's taught in school and to shape up history as it's taught in our monuments and in our museums. I'm delighted to see that some black leaders are emerging uh, in politics, in government, in leadership. I have a whole rap about this. I guess I'll get into it. Uh, I think the Democratic Party, uh, typically, the leadership of it is too uh, oriented toward the polls, if you will. And I don't mean Polish Americans, I mean the P-O-L-L-F. Um, that is, they uh, don't want to be way uh, to the left or the right of, of uh, what, where the American people are. And so they're typically vague. Well, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, I actually moved to Vermont uh, and did a, as soon as I got there, I, I found myself doing a poll, a political poll of Burlington, Vermont, because I was teaching methods in, this, in sociology. And one of the ways to learn how to do methods is to do it. And so we did an actual random sample of um, uh, Burlington. And Bernie Sanders had recently been elected mayor of Burlington. Okay, and we found all kinds of voters who voted for Bernie Sanders for mayor and then Ronald Reagan for president and then Bernie Sanders for Congress and Ronald Reagan for president again. Now, what's, how can that be? Well, both of those people told you what they were going to do and then proceeded to do it. They both had a certain integrity, whereas Walter Mondale ran against Reagan. What did he stand for? It's not at all clear, you know, Reagan was standing for the Star Wars de missile defense system and, and Mondale kind of was not exactly for that, but he had a different missile in mind and so on. So that, that I think has handicapped the Democrats uh, throughout. That is, it's not clear what they stand for. I think people will vote for somebody who believes in something and who you believe believes in something, but they don't want to be manipulated. And I think that has helped Republicans, even though most of the actual things that many Republicans stand for, many voters don't even like them, but they do vote for somebody who seems to be standing for something. And in all of this, our whole political discourse is kind of muted and mixed up 
partly because we don't understand causality and our and I, we're very unsophisticated in terms of our knowledge of history because it was so boring in high school. <laughs> what do you view then is the biggest problem for society now and maybe 10 years from now? The biggest problem? Well, I think we've got two, two big uh, problems. One is social injustice, uh, racism in particular, uh, but also the expanding uh, classism, the fact that, we, you know, our, our upper 1% is owning more and more and our lower 99% is owning less and less. Uh, and that's affecting healthcare and everything else. So that's the, the single biggest problem. And then the second biggest problem is what we are continuing to do to the environment. Uh, and, and that's in particular with regard to byproducts, uh, global warming and, and the pollution of the, of the uh, earth, of the oceans and so on. Uh, I live in the Chesapeake area and uh, I, it, it never ceases to amaze me how, uh, when I was a kid, when I was a young adult, I was a Republican and back then Republicans weren't anti-science, but the Republicans in Washington DC do actually drink water from the Chesapeake. And if they don't, because they drink bottled water, they shower in water from the Chesapeake, you know, from the Potomac and the Chesapeake Bay, uh, Bay area. And, and why are they therefore not in favor of clean water? It, it blows my mind. Self-interest, you would think, would come into mind. But those are the two key problems, social injustice and what we're doing to the, our planet. But I do think, really, that many Americans can be racist and can also be anti-racist, depending on how they are approached and the frame of rhetoric. And I'm watching these Confederate statues come down. I'm watching these uh, sundown towns stop being sundown overtly and, and being a little ashamed of it, and some of them actually taking steps to get over it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, the next few years. I think we're going to have some advances. Tell me a little bit about your other books. Well, <laughs> I have a new book, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, people sometimes think I don't write fun books. But my new book is called Upper Creek with a Paddle. And it is a book of my canoeing fiascos. Only about every other chapter has a little sociology in it and a little history in it and stuff, uh, little stuff about race relations and so on. So it's not just about uh, my canoeing fiascos. But my canoeing fiascos are pretty hilarious. And uh, so, so that's, I recommend Upper Creek with a Paddle. You don't have to buy it. Get your library to buy it once the library reopens. Um, and then you can check it out and be the first person to read it. And then other people have a shot at it. Um, Lies Across America is my book that I predicted and called for the demise of Confederate monuments. And there's a lot in it besides Confederate monuments. And a lot of statues and stuff are coming down that are not Confederate. I mean, for instance, in Dearborn, Michigan, they had this excellent uh, statue, larger than life, of the mayor, Mayor Orville Hubbard. Well, Mayor Orville Hubbard was internationally famous, actually, for keeping Dearborn all white. And, and uh, as he said, in a speech he gave to uh, the White Citizens Council and other city fathers of, of Birmingham, Alabama, teaching them how to be better segregationists, he said, uh, when somebody moves in, meaning somebody black, we're on it faster than you're on a fire. Uh, and, and they do all kinds of things to, to drive out the black, the black resident. And that's why he got reelected all these times. And that's why he got this statue. Well, the statue is now moved, okay? Uh, no longer do we supposed to salute the statue and think highly of him as we walk past it in, in front of well, the old city hall. Um, so, and it's not just on race that we're, that we're thinking better, I think, sometimes. Some of these uh, idiotic statues, oh, the, the stupidest one, the stupidest statue is in New York City, and we walk past it every day. If you've ever been to the Statue of Liberty, you've gone past it. If you've ever taken the Staten Island Ferry, because it's at the southern end of, of Manhattan Island, um, South Ferry, it's called. And it's a statue of a Dutchman wearing a whole bunch of clothes and a coat on top, and a almost naked American Indian wearing just a brief breech cloth and with a little blob of beads in the middle. 
And this Dutchman is obviously buying Manhattan for $24 worth of beads, right? You've heard that total myth. Nothing like that ever happened. Um, what this makes the Native American to look like, first of all, if it happened in, let's say, February, I've been in New York in February, he's about to die of frostbite. I also was in New York once in August. And if that's when this transaction never took place, took place then in August, the Dutchman is about to die of heat exhaustion, right? Uh, there's no way that two people would ever be dressed like that on the same spot on the earth on the same day. And nobody even thinks about that because what we're really looking at is primitive and civilized, you know? And so that's okay. We don't even think about it. But then besides that, would you sell your house? Would you sell your garden, your fields? These, these were sedentary Indians. Would you sell your hunting rights around Manhattan, uh, your fishing rights around the island? Would you sell that all for, a little, for your share of this little blob of, of uh, beads? I don't think so. And do you what? Move off to New Jersey? I mean, there's people living here. You have to fight them for taking land from them. It, it makes no sense and that's not what happened. Um, but we have this monument that claims that that's what happened. We have these second grade teachers, my second grade teacher told that to me, uh, that, that believe that this is what happened. Well, this is a canard against American Indians that's taking place in the year of our Lord 2020, right now, you know, and we need to take it down and put it in a museum with some signage around it saying, look how white supremacists we were. We actually believe this, even though it's crazy. What will you say to this was a life well lived. I, I say this in my canoeing book. Uh, I think I paddled an important river. I'm, I may get a little emotional about this because I do see the end of my life. I do have a, a terminal form of cancer. Um, and I have heard I get the best emails. I get better emails than anybody else I've ever talked with. I mean, at least once a week these days, I get an email saying, your book changed my life. And then they tell me how. So I'm happy with what I've done. I like my children. Uh, I, I like the fact that I built two and a half houses. Well, no, one and two halves houses and that they're good, you know, with my own hands and all. Uh, so. So I'm happy. Well, you certainly have contributed in so many ways, Jim. You, like, probably like me, would love to see the end of the story, and we may never have a chance to do that. But I appreciate so much your being honest with us, your being upfront about what you have to say, and that you've put in a sense, your money where your mouth is in the sense that you know, you're know you not afraid to talk about history or the correction of how history has been promulgated. So thank you so much for everything you have done in living your life. Let me make a short pitch. Your, your listeners, your viewers, they can go to my website, just type James W. Lowen into Google. It comes up first. And you can contribute. You can contribute to correcting history, and you can contribute to adding to social justice. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you for having me on.